An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno. This is Lecture 15, July 15th, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last session we spoke about the Cartesian demand that our intellectual procedure must be careful not to leave out any steps. And I attempted to show you in what sense this Cartesian axiom is actually incompatible with the approach of dialectical thought. Now Hegel was certainly not the first to express specific resistance to this procedure, and indeed a very important French conservative philosopher, de Maistre, de Maistre, Maistre <laughs> had already parodied the old Baconian um, critique of idols which was revived during the 18th century and spoken in this connection of the idole d'échelle, that is, the idol of the latter, the notion that we must always proceed step by step, that thought may not run ahead of itself, or sorry, that we must proceed step by step, that thought is never allowed to take off, which basically implies that thought may not run ahead of itself, that thought may not bring anything to bear beyond what it already has anyway. We could almost say, echoing the paradox of the flying arrow, that the rigorously applied Cartesian demand for an entirely seamless and continuous form of thought would inevitably end up in pure tautology. But it is not so much this which strikes me as essential here, although objectively speaking it seems to me to furnish an emphatic critique of any thought which can only proceed step by step. Rather, the moment which dialectic re rebels against, at least dialectic as I believe I may understand it, and indeed as I think on closer inspection, it was also deployed by Hegel himself, specifically in the phenomenology of spirit, is the coercive character of thought. We have the concept of what is logically compelling, namely an operation which leaves nothing out where there is no possibility of escaping the conclusion. And we have what psychology describes with the concept of the compulsive character, namely a human being subjected to forms of ritualistic behavior, inflexibly bound to the notion of order and incapable of genuine freedom. But there is nonetheless a remarkably powerful affinity between these two concepts of compulsion, between merely logical compulsion and the psychological compulsion to ritualistic behavior as we may observe, for example, from Ludwig Thomas de Kleinen Verwanten, a play which I saw when I was very young and which made an unforgettable impression on me. In the play, a station inspector from Grossebach, Gro Grossubach pays an un unexpected visit to relatives of his, academics by profession, who are on the point of finding a suitable husband for their young daughter. They now make fruitless efforts to get rid of their provin provincial relative lest he endanger the de delicate marriage project, but he keeps on insisting that everything must be identified in its proper category. I have never forgotten this image of someone who is to bring everything under a stable category and when, a leader, when I later came to read Kant and his deduction of the categories, I was never completely able to dispel that image of the station inspector from Grossubach. I will not try and decide here whether this is Kant's fault or my own. This implies a particular kind of obligation on the part of dialectical thought, and one which probably accounts for the resistance to such thought that we shall discuss in more detail here. For dialectical thinking is obliged to show a specific kind of mobility, namely a refusal to be nailed down precisely to that particular point, to be confined or compelled to remain at that particular point, where the chosen object or form of argumentation currently finds itself. This already became clear to me at a time when I was still far from relating these dialectical reflections. reflections relating dialectical philosophy itself to the actual practice of own thinking with the radicality that I hope um, I shall gradually be able to achieve. At the time, I had published a considerable number of theoretical pieces on musical questions, but I immediately realized that these theoretical reflections on music, which still obeyed the principle of imminence, 
namely the principle of imminent and thus above all technical critique, thereby ran the danger of assuming a narrowly specialized or even academic character. And Davini's friend of mine once told me that a certain kind of strictly technical imminent analysis always reminded him of the way they approached art in Horrocks Music School, an institution of great strictness and pedantry, which nonetheless succeeded in maintaining sub-branches in many parts of the city. Now I wanted to avoid the danger of thinking in the style of Horrocks Music School, so I experimented by producing reflections and considerations on music, which I described in both a literal and a metaphorical sense as music from the outside. I understood this in the literal sense of not hearing music as it sounds in the concert hall or the opera house, for example, but rather of hearing what an opera sounds like if we fail to return to our seats after the interval and then simply perceive all this noise from outside, of seeing what this noise tells us from outside. And I had the feeling that this brings out a side of music that we otherwise overlook. And what struck me here in more general terms was that we can really say something about a phenomenon only if, in a sense, we also look at it from the outside rather than solely from the inside. That is, if we also consider it within the social context in which it stands. And I believe as if in, as if in obedience to that famous darkling aspiration, that I was not just seeking to combine the view from outside with the view from inside in order to produce a so-called synthesis of both. For I was already vaguely aware that, while these two perspectives do belong to one another and stand in a certain tension with one another, they cannot be collapsed together. And when I talk about the mobility of thought with, re with regard to the phenomenon, what I mean to say is precisely that one must consider the phenomenon both from within in terms of its own demands, its own origin, its own principles, and also indeed from without in terms of the functional context in which it stands, the side which it turns to human beings, its meaning it specifically assumes for the life of human beings. And I may remind you that it is quite conceivable and indeed highly likely that works of art are of the greatest stature, works which in themselves are anything but mere ideology and are actually, as Hegel would say, a form in which truth appears, can nonetheless become ideology through the role which they assume within the prevailing cultural industry today. Thus, you can perhaps see that it makes good sense to pursue these two perspectives, the imminent and the transcendent approaches, independently of one another in a certain way, and simply trust that if our thoughts penetrates if our thought penetrates both aspects deeply enough, the relationship between them will reveal itself after all, a trust which, I must admit, I have never been able to relinquish to this day. This double-edged character of thought, which must therefore be at once within the matter and outside of it, and which is also involved in the method pursued by Hegel in the phenomenology of spirit, this very double-edged character of thought expresses something essential to dialectical thought, and it is only for that reason, and not for the sake of some passing aperçu, aperçu, that I am talking about this idea of the mobility of thought here today. For dialectical thinking does indeed imply the unremitting effort to bring together the universal and the particular, the hic a nunce and its concept, while remaining aware that there is no immediate or unmediated identity between these moments and that. Indeed, the, they diverge from one another. I would say that the epistemological dialectical place of what I have called the mobility of thought, in contrast to all merely inductive or merely deductive intellectual procedures, is precisely the attempt of thought, now abiding with itself, now moving beyond itself, ultimately to bring the knowing subject that approaches from without together with the movement of the matter itself. This is something which is necessarily involved in the dialectical method. And if we distinguish these things, if we refrain from seeking any blank identity between them, if we are able, on the contrary, to alternate these genera, as it were, if such alternation is the very color of dialectical thought, this does not simply spring from an artistic nature, which is incapable of thinking in any other way. It is because this is actually the color of dialectic itself the color of a kind of thinking that unites identity and non-identity.
but it is clear that specifically with regard to this aspect which I have just described for you so suspiciously, as I might put it, so suspiciously precisely because so seductively, it is obvious that the strongest possible resistance will instantly be, be provoked. When it is claimed that this is a privileged form of thought available only to those who are particularly fitted for it, one that certainly cannot be translated without more ado into a universally binding method, this is the most innocuous form of resistance that I have mentioned. The much more widespread suspicion regarding the mobility of thought arises from the charge that such thought effectively avoids responsibility, that it is a slippery and unreliable form of thinking which eludes our grasp which we cannot hold down and thus really evades any firm decision about what is true or false. If we remember the fundamental reflections about the true and the false which we have already presented, the first thing to say is that even this, which I have just expressed in a rather crass manner, is actually not so inapplicable to the concept of dialectic. For a single individual judgment, taken in isolation, is indeed neither absolutely true nor absolutely false. And the truth is actually nothing but the path that leads precisely through the falseness of our individual judgments. All the same, given that philosophy and science always also plays a part in the power struggles between individuals, groups, states, classes, nations, and so on, a certain suspicion is naturally appropriate at this point. For if our thought is only mobile enough, if we relinquish real argument rather than just refusing to be bound by it in a rigid manner, as we suggested here, then we may be tempted to do what Socrates, the ancient practitioner of dialectic, was specifically accused of doing. Um, Tanhito Logan Credo Poyin? Or, oh, making the weaker word appear the stronger, like the nimble and well-oiled wrestler who can defeat his stronger and simpler opponent, or like the clever talker who knows precisely how to cheat the peasant out of his cows. Now this ancient objection to the sophistical appearance of dialectic, which I mentioned by way of anticipation right at the beginning of these lectures, is not to be taken slightly. And we cannot, of course, deny that dialectic, and especially certain dialectical forms of argumentation, can indeed degenerate into this kind of evasion we have mentioned. You will repeatedly discover that the more differentiated our critical intellectual reflections become, the less rigidly they unfold, the more variables they thereby take up into themselves, the more they must also forfeit string stringency in their traditional sense, and the more they are thereby exposed to the danger which I have just outlined for you. And it is expo or sorry, and it is specifically philosophical d discussions on the highest level, which generally prove especially vulnerable to this danger. In the first place, I would say that this danger can only really be allayed by that freedom with regard to the object which Hegel asked for, in the sense that any practice of philosophy, and especially critical philosophy, is legitimate only as long as it is reflective about itself, and that also means as long as it does not demand to be in the right. We could almost say with due exaggeration that the renunciation of this demand is a criterion of the truth of thought itself that in a sense thought must set itself in the wrong, though in a way that can, that con, that convicts the very demand to be in the right of its narrow and limited character. But this on its own is hardly enough, for I believe that what strongly emerges here is precisely what I described a couple of sessions ago, in a way that may well seem paradoxical and surprising to several of you as the positivistic element in dialectical thought an element, incidentally, which in a sense was also emphasized by Benjamin in his Vindication of Induction and the preface to his work, The Origin of German Tragic Drama. The only way of meeting the chronic danger of that metabasis ice allo genos, which is involved, which is involved the mobility of thought, it seems to me, is an extraordinary obligation to expose ourselves to the object in its specificity. Thus, if we are talking about particular epistemological questions, I would say that it is a false argument or a false kind of dialectic if we try to direct the discussion by claiming that specific motifs, 
which have already been subjected to criticism in this connection nonetheless possess a good, useful, respectable, or positive function for their part within the totality of the form of thought in question. For in that case, we should simply keep to the original epistemological problematic. The path of dialectic, which attempts to move beyond the specialist and highly circumscribed perspective of logic and epistemology, would be one which did not content, content itself with simply identifying the point which requires criticism and then declaring, look, there's a mistake in the reasoning here. You've got yourself entangled in contradiction. The whole thing is therefore worthless. Rather, the next step would be to show why, within the constellation of such thinking, the relevant mistakes and contradictions inevitably arise, what has motivated them within the movement of such thought, and thus how far they reveal themselves in the total context of thought to be significant in their own falsehood and contradictoriness. This is actually the most important thing one can learn about the discipline of dialectical thought, since dialectical thinking does not start from any rigid concepts, from a rigid, from a rigid system, from any rigid givens, but is eminently required to abandon itself to the matter itself. It can only really avoid the danger of that relativism, that arbitrariness, that spurious uh, flexibility of which we have spoken if it takes that obligation towards the individual object, not more loosely, but indeed more seriously than the usual sciences and our usual habits of thought typically do. If it immerses itself in individual problems, with an incomparably greater seriousness than conventional thinking ever allows. Now, if you ask me here for some kind of rule for how to proceed in this regard, for how to accomplish this, you will only embarrass me, for I can offer you no such general rule, and that would indeed be to demand too much of dialectical thought. All I can say to you, where dialectical thought is required to explore any specific object, is that we must expressly reflect whether we have tarried long enough with the latter, whether we have looked at it so closely that it begins of its own accord to come alive, or whatever we have contented ourselves merely with a conventional cast, as it were, with the stereotypical pre-given concepts of the thing in question. I would like to take this opportunity to point out that I have no intention of simply recommending dialectic to you here as the best method of thinking. Dialectical thinking is indeed the best. This is a slogan, but it is not the truth. Dialectical thought, as such, can of course be misused for any conceivable mischief in the world, just as much as any other form of thought, and if it possesses any advantage on this level, I would say it is this. Precisely as a method of mobility and continual self-reflection, it may involve a moment that makes us rather more alert and skeptical in relation to such misuse, or in relation to the obtuseness of traditional thought, than is generally the case. The suspicion which dialectic encounters at this point, the general suspicion with, re with regard to the mobility of thought, is itself grounded in social factors. Such mobile thinking is generally identified with relativism, with a refusal to acknowledge anything determinate or firmly established at all. Instead of seeing that the movement of such thought proceeds precisely by taking what is determinate and firmly established even more seriously, this is exactly the domain where the dialectical approach is accused of being essentially ungrounded, of offering us nothing established to hold on to, of representing a form of thought that only ever deprives us of, of something without giving anything back. The tacit assumption here is already the affirmative one, that thought, rather than abandoning itself to the matter itself, is supposed to fulfill a particular psychological function to set us on firm ground or to warm our hearts, just as sentimental heartwarming literature does. And what is commonly described as a Weltanschauung or worldview, which can never be distinguished too strongly from genuine philosophical thought, is indeed intimately related, related to the sphere of heartwarming literature, even where the content of such literature assumes the form of Buddhistic, Buddhistic pessimism. That, that matters little in this connection, and it is already quite wrong to demand that philosophy give us anything at all in this sense. For it is we who must give something to philosophy, namely everything, our entire conscious experience, and we must be prepared to enter into rather questionable que kinds of speculation.
while recognizing that in return for what we give in this regard, we may, we may well not receive back what is commonly expected of philosophy. This approach naturally arises from the circumstance, if I may introduce a sociological exercise here, that the more rural parts of agricultural sectors of the population must usually pay the price of progress in that universal advance of rationalization, which indeed increasingly undermines the merely direct connection of human experience and thought to the realm of nature. These parts of the population, therefore, rather than radicalizing the idea of progress itself to the point where they too would receive justice for themselves, tend to lay the blame on this principle of mobility, as if the itinerant peddlers were to blame for the increasing poverty of the peasantry, selling them pitiful wares for a pitiful return. I am not sure whether such peddlers still exist today, but I think it would be better for us philosophers to confess that we do have something of the peddler about us than to sport old-fashioned costume and betake ourselves to the mountains in the style of the settler who still knows all the train times, as Degas wonderfully put it. That is all for now regarding the charge of groundlessness. The assumption that thought should always stand on firm ground, that it must never be deprived of such ground under any circumstances, is essentially bound up with that notion of a given absolute first, absolutely first principle of the primacy of such a ground or principle which we have already criticized. Dialectical thought must confront this issue. There is no such ground for philosophy, at least not for philosophy today, any more than contemporary society can still be grasped on the basis of its supposedly natural foundations, any more than agricultural agriculture is still crucial for contemporary society. For here the truth itself is a dynamic truth, where the primordial moments, as they say, do still also appear as moments as moments of the archaic, as moments of memory, or however you want to describe them, but not as something to which any higher substantial meaning could be ascribed from the metaphysical, moral, or logical point of view. The core of thought, that which is actually substantial in thought, that which allows it to show its true and m truth and makes it more than merely empty talk, this core is not the unshakable ground on which it stands, nor is it some reified, detachable thesis to which we might point and say. Well then, there it is. That is what it, it has to say. There it stands. It can do no other. God help this thought. These are all notions about the content of philosophy, which, is, which have sprung from considerations of conscience, from the need to show our colors, which generally suggests that the only true and responsible thought for those who profess it is one which can be called to justify at every suitable opportunity by the relevant boards and commissions. In other words, all this effectively implies the denial of that moment of intellectual freedom, which provides the essential climate for the dynamic exploration of philosophical thought. For the core or substance of thinking is the latent power from which thought is ultimately drawn, the light which falls upon things through thought which is not itself thing-like, not some reified object to which one then has to swear allegiance. This is the idole d'échelle, for which truth ultimately depends on the demand that thought must be able at any and every moment to justify the ground on which it stands and the reified core that forms its content. Whereas we have to recognize that this substantial moment is something that stands behind thought a source of power rather than something like a thesis, something we could just repeat or take into possession merely by a process of checking or control. I have no wish to impugn the notion of method methodical control, and I think you will already have recognized that. The conceptions of dialectic, which I am trying to unfold for you here, really have nothing to do with a kind of wild and unbridled thinking which has simply forgotten everything that critical philosophy has developed in the way of methodical control. Dialectical thought cannot possibly proceed in this way, since it emerges strictly from critical thought, is itself nothing but philosophical critique brought to its most acute point of self-awareness. But I would specifically like to remind you that the concept of philosophy, which we are trying to develop here, is not a merely isolated or specialist one,
but one which is meant to be significant for the vital concerns of your own work. And thus I would like to point out that this concept of methodical or intellectual control, which certainly plays a very important role with regard to dialectical thought, has itself undergone considerable changes over the course of time. Now the idea of such methodical control, and indeed with potential reference to all individuals and all questions, namely to everyone who shares the faculty of reason, was originally intended to liberate thought from all dogmatic tutelage, was simply designed to prevent human beings from submitting to arbitrary claims of any kind. It was directed above all against certain fundamental theological arguments which appealed to miracles and the possibility of rational or empirical control was most emphatically asserted in this regard. But today the concept of intellectual control has largely, I will not say absolutely, but largely reversed its original function. For today, it effectively amounts to preventing a non-conformist form of thought thought which cannot simply be translated into a step-by-step -step approach to knowledge, namely into a development of what is already given, a form of thought which cannot just be reproduced by anyone whatsoever and at any time whatsoever. The principle of the gradual acquisition of knowledge basically amounts to the idea that we can only ever think what is already known with constant variations, as it were, in a process of in infinitesimal transition to the new. And this idea negates those fractures in truth and knowledge which are rooted in the fractures of the world itself and which furnish the content of genuine knowledge as such, in view of the danger that I seem to be contradicting certain democratic rules of the game where knowledge is concerned. I should perhaps say here that even in the universi Universitas Literarum, in the Republic of the Learned, the notion that everyone must check every thought at least in their own professional field, that the truth or dignity of an intellectual achievement must be judged in each case by the number of positive recommendations that have been garnered from professional colleagues strikes me as extraordinarily problematic. For the consciousness to which we actually appeal here as a criterion of truth is for its part a consciousness that has already been shaped by the mechanisms of social accommodation and one which tends in many cases to excise what is actually essential to thought. But of course, there is also no guarantee that a non-conformist thought is necessarily true. For precisely through the kind of intellectual control which has now become universal, everything which escapes it tends in turn to assume an apocryphal or rather far-fetched character, and indeed in extreme cases, such as that of the originally highly gifted and recently deceased psychoanalyst Wilhelm Reich may ultimately come to appear paranoiac or even fraudulent. In our current situation, we are actually confronted with a very grave antinomy. On the one hand, thought is consumed in the blind repetition of what exists and is known anyway, namely in conformity. And on the other, thought which eludes methodi methodical control thereby runs the danger of becoming uncontrollable in any sense and effectively falling into delusion. And this tendency is surely not the least innocuous of those symptoms of intellectual dissociation and collecti collective schizophrenia, which we can observe today in so many areas of our life, and one that deserves, it seems to me, to be taken with extraordinary seriousness. The truly new, by contrast, is thus always a qualitative leap, to use Hegel's language, a qualitative leap not in the sense of a kind of thought which leaps anywhere, but in the sense of a leap which is produced by persistent exposure to the object itself. And expressed in these terms, this approach stands in inevitable contrast, in extreme contrast to the adoption of some quite new or quite different standpoint. When I spoke earlier about the mobility of thought, and if you like, defended this mobility, I should perhaps add, in order to protect this specially, or this especially vulnerable thought from misunderstanding, that mobility of thought here does not mean a constant readiness to change what is generally described as a standpoint. Rather, it refers to a self-reflective change in the approach of thought, depending on whether it has to relate to the context in which the particular stands or to the particular itself. But this essence of philosophy, and I believe that the important philosophers specifically since Hegel are actually all agreed on this, seems to lie precisely in the repudiation of anything like the concept of a standpoint,
although this is exactly what defines the popular notion of philosophy as a kind of world view. Thus, in place of some such externally introduced standpoint, what is involved here is actually the compelling movement of the matter itself, something which is also captured in the Cartesian doctrine of a, gradually adv of a gradual advance from one point to another. The movement of thought, the dynamic moment of thought, is also contained in that Cartesian axiom, which we criticized earlier. If I omitted any reference to this positive aspect here, that is because I regard this as almost self-evident. Descartes himself also knew, of course, that knowledge is essentially a process rather than a merely immediate kind of recognition. It is just that he could only grasp the movement of thought which he saw and articulated. And this is precisely the bourgeois aspect, which strikes me as untrue here, in the image of what is static and rigid, and the symbol of the latter, which appears in this connection, and which was mocked by de Maistre, is itself the sign that even what is dynamic appears only in congealed form here. This dynamic itself appears as if it were thing-like and immobile, as a freezing of movement into something static, and this has somehow, somehow always been inscribed in philosophy in the most remarkable fashion, even in, it, even in its most dynamic representatives from Heraclitus through to Hegel. And if there is one decisive sense in which dialectical thought must move beyond Hegel himself, then it is surely here at the very point I have described.